right, here we go. Episode two, season two of the Run the Tibby podcast. I'm your host, Steven Diaz, a.k.a. Kodak White. Here with me, we have my bro sandwich, TJ Tibbs, and the human version of a cat, Harry Hazen. So today, we are going to break down everything, pick and roll. So I want to start by asking, what is the most important skill for a player to have to be a successful pick and roll player? Go ahead, coach. Well, obviously, it depends what level you're at. But if we're just talking about the top of the top levels and the best pick and roll players, I think the awareness of where every defender is is the most important thing, Um, particularly the low man, right? So whoever the low man is, what's the low man doing? Where's their body leaning to? Are they tagging early? Are they not tagging? Um, is somebody inching in a little bit too early? I think the better awareness you have about what everybody else on the court is doing besides the ball handler defender and the screen defender, I think the better pick and roll player you have because the pick and roll is created to give you an unfair advantage in the game of basketball. And the defense is trying to figure out how they're going to stop this unfair advantage of this, of this ball screen happening. So once you get this advantage, it is your job to understand, just like any other advantage that you can gain in basketball, what everybody else is doing and where the ball should go next. Or maybe wish the ball should go, but you have to put it somewhere else for the ball to eventually get there. So that's what I think. So like pattern recognition, vision? Pattern recognition. Yeah, I know how I feel about pattern recognition. I know. Pattern I, recognition. It's I, one yeah. of the big five fundamentals. That's, that's your is. buzzword. <laughs> It's actually two words, but I understand what you did there. Buzz phrase. Yeah, buzz phrase, but words. But yeah, pattern recognition for me, um, understanding because at a lot of levels, if one team is hedging the pick and roll, then they're going to continue to hedge the pick and roll. So you have to understand what people are doing. And then I think as you get more advanced, knowing, um, you know, then working inwards towards what the two uh, defenders are doing on the ball. So the pick and roll defender, the screen defender and the on ball defender. I'm going to go first off. You're not wrong. Like that's obviously important, but I'm going to say going with what you said, if we're talking about the highest level of basketball, the most important thing is shooting threes. So one again, only in the NBA, uh, if you're primarily seeing drops, drop coverages, if you get a ball screen from 40 feet away and you can shoot from 35, you're one of the three best point guards in the league. So that's one. And then two, if you can shoot period, like no matter what level you are, if you can shoot period, then they actually have to guard you, which then creates the dominoes effect of everything you're talking about. But if you can't shoot and people are just going under, under everything, especially in like the lower levels where what we were talking about the other day, like the automatic rescreen isn't a thing until you get to like, I'd say really high level college basketball. If people just go under your screens in high school, then like, what are you going to do? You're just going to barrel your way to the rim and it'll probably work if you're a lot better than everybody else. But at some point I would say shooting threes, whether it be out of a drop or even if people just go under is probably the most important thing it's probably also the hardest thing to like attain but i would say it's the most important yeah i think i think that um to tibbs's point like that is reading that low man is like at a pretty advanced level um because i think in high school i think the game is more of like a two-man game as opposed to when you're in college and at higher levels it becomes like more like a five man game. But I was listening to Tyrese Halliburton talk on the JJ Reddick podcast. And he was talking about Dame. He was talking about guarding Dame and yeah. how the coaches told him that the pickup point was 40 feet away from the basket. And he was shooting threes for, from the story was he was shooting threes from like 50 feet and he made it. And he looked back at his coach and he was like, what am I supposed to do with that? But what that, threat does for him in the pick and roll game is it stretches that it stretches that out so much that that post screen action out so much that he can really get downhill and he has so much space to take advantage of whatever the the defense gives him 
but yeah, I think like range at a high level is important and can give you a lot of advantages on a pick and roll. But I think that at a basic high school level, I think you need to be able to dribble the ball. Um, I think you need to be able to shoot the ball off the dribble. And you need to be able to to at least see one level of uh, of passing of the game. How many levels right, do you can... think? How many levels do you think you need to see? Like at what point? At what? When you talk about reading the low man, like is that three level passing? You talk about like levels of passing a lot. Can you yeah. just elaborate on that? Yeah. So like it, the first level of the ball screen pick and roll is just you know what is what is the screen defender doing right so what is this guy doing and that's how most pick and roll reads are really taught like if they hedge we're gonna you know we're gonna attack their hip or we're gonna pivot and throw back to the shake man or whatever the case may be and the second level is is basically like how can i get the ball to the roll man <laughs> or what is the what what is the low man doing and the third level is like, what is everybody doing? Like, I don't see the, I don't see the screen defender. I don't care about the guy who's the third man involved because really pick and roll usually is some sort of three man game or two man game, right? Or defensively as well. So if they're guarding it with three men, then it's like, all right, what's the low man doing? And do I need to give the ball to the guy who's covering the low man? And then the, with the third level is, okay, yeah, the low man may be bumping the roll man, but now you got somebody playing two who's on and off the backside. And now how do I deceive that person to make that right pass? So the next person has a shot or he has an easy kick out to the next person. So I think that's the, the that's the three levels of pass of the, of the pick and roll game. And I would say even basic in high school is this is an undertaught thing or underappreciated thing is how well do you set up the ball screen? Like, are you, it's the ball handler's responsibility, especially in the younger ages, to run your man into that screen. So how well are you actually setting it up and 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 how are you getting your advantage? You know, so how are you able to first get your advantage and then kind of maintain your advantage? Because a lot of times in defenses in high school, what are you seeing? You're seeing switch, you're seeing hedge, hedge, or you're seeing confusion. Double. I don't well, know. You might see some double. You might see double. If, yeah. if you're the guy, you're probably going to get double. Yeah, yeah. But you, a lot of times, like, you'll watch high school games, and I think teams have plans, especially against the guy who's going to use the pick and roll the most. Like, teams have a plan what they want to do. But a lot of times there's confusion based on personnel or based on when subs come in because it's in a regular high school game. You know, we're not talking about high-level high school. In a regular high school game, I mean, it, once you start subbing guys, you know, they may be able to execute the plan, but how how complicated are you making it, you know? And mm -hmm. the game and the pick and roll is all about where can I find more space to operate? Like, how can I find that? You know, whether it's shooters that shoot from deeper. You know, Houston Rockets used to put down a four-point line, and now you see it almost in every NBA practice facility, the four-point mm -hmm. line. Like, you're literally not going to get four points, but it's just that extra spacing. Um, so how am I going to get that extra space? And then defensively, where am I going to condense the space? Like, where can I, whether it's helping off a shooter or not picking up as high? Um, I think all those things come into play. Can I just say something about setting up ball screens? Um, me and Diaz were watching film with somebody, and uh, I think, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun on overtaught, undertaught, because you said something to that effect. Um, I think the whole, like, getting lower than free throw line extended is, like, a really overtaught thing like first off i've seen a workout where someone had their kids like back down dribbling almost to the corner just to come off the ball screen and it's just so it's so unrealistic and it puts you in such a bad spot that i think there's so much more dynamic reads like you can't just say i'm getting free throw line excited and coming off a ball screen and you're going to do that for 32 minutes you know what i mean so i think that's where and I'm sure we'll talk about like how you work on stuff. I think that's where like live play would come into effect in like your practices. Cause you can't, you can't just expect that to work every single time. You know what I mean? You can't. And I think that's like really overtaught. Yeah. I think that's just basketball in general too. Like, I think we get hung up on like spots on the floor. 
um, yeah. which is a good landmark. But when it comes to like shooting and stuff, it, you almost you need to be able to shoot from yeah that general area. But there's only a few exact areas where you're probably gonna get shots from, and it depends on your game. Like the elbow, like if you're a scorer, getting to the elbow, that's like a landmark. That's like your spot, right? One of your, your hot spots. The corner, anybody that spots up in the corner, um, the, cor- the corner is not changing, you know? Uh, you're, if you're rotate, relocating to the corner or you're just standing in the corner and occupying the corner, the corner is not going to change. Um, and if you're like a big and you're getting like a trail three, like you're almost always going to get it from the same spot. But other than that, when it comes to just like, running a pick and roll or even just like relocating, lifting or shaking, you might catch the, you're not going to catch the ball exactly on the wing where you practice. Your angle might be a little off. So, um, you know, I think that's where it comes from. We like to ideally be in the spot, like saying this slot ball screen is going to occur on the slot, but it might be a foot off the slot. Um, and defensively yeah. it's their job to push you off that spot, you know? So, you know, I think that is a good point. So back to, back to getting uh, to your spot, and and holding it off and waiting for um, the screens. I know that Harry has kind of put me on to this, like as we've as we've uh, watched film on you know players like uh, the Villanova guys and stuff like that. Harry, do you think that um, backing your guy down or like essentially posting up to wait for a screen is it is something that's undertaught, especially at like high school levels? I would say in general, uh, learning how to play with your back to the basket is undertaught. So I would say yes. I would definitely say yes. I don't really have a long answer to that. That's just my. Oh, no, no. What, what What do you think is the advantage to? I don't disagree or agree. But what do you? What is the advantage you think? Look, to- here's here's the advantage to anyone who hasn't watched Illinois play. Go watch Andre Corbello because of. All the all the things he can do with a basketball in his hand, especially in high school, um, he he would just back, put his back to his defender the entire length of the court, and he would either go continue to go in that same direction, or he would just do his little uh, reverse spin, and it worked every time. It worked every single time. So, how how many players realistically at the high school level do you see do that that effectively? Do you Not think it's lot. hard to guard? Do you think it's hard to guard because people don't see it that often, or do you think there's like some sort of like? I mean, yeah, I would say, and I think we've spoken about this with posting up in general. No one really, even just going close to the basket as a guard. To to all three of us, have we ever learned how to guard somebody whose back is towards us? No, not, not no. until I was in high school and not unless it was like a post-up. So he's not going right. it the same way in the perimeter. Right. But even when it gets to guarding post-ups, a lot of that stuff is like how you deny that person from getting to that spot. But you're never really taught and you really don't get any reps at guarding people who aren't facing you. If you play three dribble one-on-one, you're checking the ball up and you're facing each other. You're not like, you know what I'm saying? So the, as an offensive player if you can do that really well whoever's guarding you you're already at an advantage because they've they haven't been here in this scenario as much as they have in every other scenario where they have to guard a perimeter player so and that's why a kid like Andre or a guy like Steve Nash who is also really good at that like you don't have to do a lot you don't have to it's not very taxing because the the read is so simple and the defense doesn't know what to do because they've never been there. You know what I'm saying? So that's where I think the advantage is. The advantage isn't the advantage isn't in so much all the options that you have with your back to your defender. It's just the advantage of like the defense doesn't know how to guard you. I like that. Yeah. I think, I think Andre is uh, excellent in the pick and roll for a lot of reasons, but I think that that like his quickness and obviously his ability to pass the ball, but, um, I think that there are things that can be taken from his game that a player slower than him um, can use to their advantage and and put in their game, and that is definitely one of them. Getting used to used to having your uh, back to the basket on the perimeter and handle pressure while waiting for whatever action you need to uh, open up. But I wanted to ask, um, at what age do you think? players should start to learn 
uh, to use the pick and roll properly because I've seen a lot of people, you know, like when you coach like the third grade team, right? And there's the little kids on the court and they can barely dribble the ball and the coach tells them, go like this and somebody <laughs> will come set a screen for you and <laughs> go like that. And then the, the the big kid that just wants to play football his whole life just like decks the, decks the kid guarding the kid with the ball. And it's and and then it's mayhem after that. So like, what age? Like, is eighth grade a good general age for uh, players to learn how to use a pick and roll? So, this is gonna sound really crazy, but I think they uh, should start learning in third grade. Wow. Um, how to how to use the pick and roll, and here's why: it's so prominent in today's game. And obviously, a third grade pick and roll is they're not going to be doing third level passing. But here's here's the thing, though: we don't know. Like, I don't know what a kid's innate feel is in the pick and roll unless you put them in that situation. So you put a third grader in a pick and roll. Nobody knows what they're doing. People are running all over the place, and the kid is constantly not making the right read, but just has a feel for where like somebody's open and giving them the ball, or like maybe doing some sort of. So now you start to see a kid, like you may have the smallest kid out there handling the basketball and developing that person to be a point guard because that's what happens in these these programs, like these CYO programs and stuff, right? You you slot these kids in a role in third and fourth grade and then they just get older and the kids never get out of these roles. And you don't realize that you're a five man who's six one and is never going to grow again. He's six one to sixth grade and he's never going to grow again. Could have been your best pick and roll player or ball handler. So I think... And it comes down to something that the, the way I see it is exposure versus application. So I think it's okay to expose kids to certain things that they're not going to apply, maybe not for a while, so that they have a general feel and idea of what it's supposed to look like. Because you may teach a fifth grader, sixth grader, seventh grader, eighth grader, pick and roll, you might guys might be great, knows all the reads, and then you get in the game and they're playing zone. Right. Not that you can't run pick and roll against the zone, but they're playing zone or you get pressed the whole entire game. And it's a it's a it's a um, ping pong game. It's just going back and forth. But when they go to high school and majority of man to man is playing and they go to high school where they're using a the pick and roll, they have been taught some things to it. So they're not just completely behind and learning it for the first time. Um, and I think that the same way with training. I think that's what training is. I don't think it's it's put that way a lot. I don't think it's applied. I don't think it's um, taught to the kids that way. Like I'm exposing you to this, a small part, I'm exposing you to this, but this is not something that you should be using in a game right now. Like this does not fit your game, but I'm exposing it to you. So when the time comes, like this is just not a new concept. So I think kids should be learning it as soon as possible. This is a ball screen. You have to be set. Um, Ball handle, you have to wait for your screener to be set, okay? And I think that's very important. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> shout out to Coach Buck. Well said. I, I see where you're coming from. No, uh, here's, here's my thing, and I don't want to go on a tangent about youth basketball because that could be a whole podcast. But uh, in third grade, there's two problems with that. Um, one – I would highly, uh, I would never recommend at, at like that young of an age, any situation where you're just bringing more people to the ball because kids don't. Why? That is the number one issue. It's, <laughs> hold on, hold on. Excuse hold on. my French. It's going to turn to a shit show. You got four people in two feet of space. And first of all, third grade. First of all, all of the kids have zero idea what spacing <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah. So hold, hold on. on, let me hold let on. Me. Hold on. No, 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 no. I've watched many of third grade games. It's a jump ball fest, right? It's a jump ball fest without the pick and roll. So you're gonna tell me you don't want there to be more of a jump ball fest because it's the pick and roll now? It's a jump ball fest anyway. So now you're blaming the pick and roll for being a jump ball fest? Wait, hmm. you made hold on. You made a point and you said that you can't tell if a kid has an innate feel in the pick and roll without putting them in the pick and roll, you can absolutely tell. <laughs> you can absolutely tell who, 
is, is <laughs> going to be a good pick and roll player and who is not. That kid that can dribble once, puts the ball in the hand, put the ball in two hands, and then dribbles again and then is running with the ball, he's probably not going to be that good of a pick and roll player. Let me ask you a question. Maybe, maybe it'll take Let me him a ask you a question. <laughs> when you were third grade, Queen, so, uh, I got tape. Queen of Peace, when you were third tape. grade, Queen of Peace, you, the clinic. You you wasn't doing that. You was just you was just good from the beginning. Y'all was bro. nice when y'all was in third grade. Bro, I got tape, bro. Be I honest, you don't even need a ball screen in third grade. If you're better, you can just run by somebody. But can of I get course. to my second point? Can I get to my second yeah. point? Because it's it yeah, is on. very relevant to what we're talking about right now. I think the the other and this is a problem with youth basketball, period, is the the premise that us in the coaching world have said millions of times the the pass moves faster than you give the ball up until you can throw a skip pass that's literally not true so if i to to answer your original question i would say you should start learning pick and roll stuff when everyone on the court is strong enough to throw a skip pass because then there's there's really nothing that could that could happen i i think when kids are strong enough to shoot a three that's yeah. when they could learn pick and roll passing. You should not. I don't want to see none of this if you can't reach the rim. I don't want to see it. And it's, it's funny because I uh, this past summer I was working out uh, a girls AAU team and they, a lot of them were like super young incoming freshmen and sophomores at a lot of public schools. And we were going like their coach was like, yeah, I want you to go over pick and roll stuff with them. And all I did was like a small sided three person game where you had a strong side corner and then a ball screen. And I said, yo, if this person, if the low person helps throw a skip pass to the corner. And a lot of them were just like, yo, I can't really throw that. You know, and, and every possession was just like a dead possession because they can't throw the ball to the open person. If you cannot throw, and this, that's no slight to those girls because they figured it out after uh, a few you're, you're a bad trainer for that. That's fine. But <laughs> you bad trainer before that. <laughs> I mean, listen, Andre already said I suck. So listen, we're here. Um, again, that's no slight to those girls. But if you can't throw, if everyone on the court isn't capable of operating in that level of spacing to what you said before, what's the point of a ball screen? Because I just think that, and let's go back to the third grade thing, because they can't make any pass. And I just think that what would be a win for me if I was running a program? And this is like a dream of mine, honestly, to like oversee a CYO program, third grade to eighth grade. I like really, really want to do that. Because if I watch the practice and I say, all right, guys, we're learning man to man. My expectation with pick and roll is can the ball handler wait for the guy who's setting the screen to be set? And then can the ball handler successfully dribble his man into the screen anything after that is is honestly a super bonus i think there's something to be said about that because there are people in the 12th grade that cannot do that cannot wait and cannot they don't have that feel and you guys know how i feel about it for the last month now i never thought feel could be taught i probably said this on this podcast and now i am a super believer that feel can be taught to an extent i'm a super believer of it now I've completely changed in the past month or so. And I think that's a part of it because you put a kid in a situation that maybe he leaves your team in the third grade and goes somewhere else and never works on a pick and roll again because he's the shooter, right? And he doesn't get any pick and rolls. Then he gets into high school and the, the dumb third grade stuff and he knows at the very least, I have to wait for this guy to be set because that's a huge thing. I, if, if, if fear rates me, it, it, it frustrates me to, to no end. When my guys pick up a moving screen. Because I really think a lot of people say, oh, that's the ball handler's fault. No, man, it's really both of their fault. It's both of their faults. And, and it's so infuriating and frustrating when that happens. And I think a lot of it, not that it would stop happening, but I think that's something you could teach in third grade. And I'm not saying use a lot of time of it, but I think it's something that should definitely be introduced and you should be exposed to. Like, I really, really believe that. I don't have an expectation for these kids to come off and be making no-look passes across the court. I just want to see them use the, literally use the screen. And then, what if you get a third grader? Because I work with a fourth grader this summer, and I'm going to tell you this much. The kid has the skill to defuse pick and rolls. I don't know if he understands what that means, 
I've seen him do it on accident. But now if you tell the kid to how to do that on purpose, first of all, he's chopping up every single fourth grader. <laughs> they see a screen coming. They're literally only thinking about that. And you're just rejecting it every single time. He's literally scoring 1 million points a game. And that concept holds true almost all the way up to the professional level. Rejecting pick and rolls is such an undertaught thing. And it's something that you can innately develop from a young age. So why not? So they're doing it and they, they, understand, they might not understand why they're doing it. But they said, oh, you know what? I'm going to I'm just going to do it. And they get into the habit of doing because I didn't Tibbs, know. Tibbs' CYO program is going to be icing screen rolls in the third grade. We are. We're going to be icing in the third grade. We're going to be icing side ball screens and then we're getting ice cream after the game. <laughs> <laughs> If we su- guys, if we successfully <laughs> ice five ball screens, we get ice pops after the game. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. I'm just dead serious. I think I really, be- I really believe in that. And it might be very frustrating and stuff, but coaching at young age is you're gonna be full of frustration anyway. I have a question. You're a third grade coach. What is what are the prereqs for? Uh, are there prereqs for ball screen? Uh, for for a pick and roll ball handler, like, do you have to be able to dribble with both hands successfully for a decent no. amount of time? <laughs> no, you All don't. Right. Which is crazy. No, you you can be anybody on the court, bro. You could be anybody on the court. Anybody on the court. One, if I was a CYO program director, I would mandate for twenty minutes. If you had an hour and a half practice twice a week for twenty minutes each practice, you have to rotate. Kids are using ball screens, two on two ball screens. That's it. That's one like you do two on two in college ball screen. It's like a it's it's like whack because you have so much of the court. You got to really shrink the court. How do you do that? But two on two ball screen in third grade is amazing because they can't use all the space. They can't just throw the ball to the kid going. So I like that a lot. Twenty minutes a day would be kids using the pick and roll and defending the pick and roll. Okay. Okay. Enough. Enough that. about kids. Enough about kids. You brought up. Uh, college and two on two and that brought me to this question is two questions actually is the pick and roll at at the college level is the pick and roll a two-man game and is working on the pick and roll uh by doing it two on oh is that effective at all and why do so many people do that well Harry, you want to jump on the second part first because i got an answer for the first part yeah we could do that um two on oh pick and roll is stupid that's that's my short answer because you know because this is my favorite this is the funniest thing to see like side ball screen happens like they it's two on no so the guy dribbling comes off he throws the overhand throws the overhead and then the the roller dribbles off hands it off to him and then they like play off that what is happening i mean i'm not even getting into all that i just think in general we've talked about this uh steve any, any sort of, of workout where there's a big and a guard, I think is pointless because here's, here's what it actually is. It's the guard is working on all this stuff coming off a ball screen and the big ain't working on shit, but dunking a basketball. So that's why I think it's stupid because the big never actually gets to work on anything. That's my it. opinion. I, I disagree with that, mm, but I do. I, do I still think, I still think two on O can be stupid, but I think. I disagree. Listen, with that. you're telling me you've never seen all these workouts where there's a big and a guard. The guard comes off the screen, does a couple between the legs, retreat, whatever, comes off the re screen, does all this stuff. And then the second coach passes the big ball, and all he's done, <laughs> <laughs> all he's done is this, this, took in two, takes two steps and shoots. It's like, are you really doing that much? In comparison to the guard, is the guard is clearly the one getting a lot better here. You're better off separating them which is why I don't think they should work out together, in my opinion. No, I, I disagree. I understand. However, what I do understand, which is maybe the standpoint you're coming from, if you're a coach and you want to develop some sort of continuity between your big and your guard, that's fine. But if I had a big and a guard come to me to work out and they don't play together, no. then yeah. why are you here together? The, one yeah. of you is about to either do an all big workout or an all guard workout because we're not no, doing I- that. And I've no, done it before, and I hate it. It's the worst. I hate it. No, I understand that. I understand it from that perspective. So I guess it's perspective. But I just think that, well, even this, though, I think it's important for bigs. There's a lot to learn because short roll is a very prominent thing in today's game. You rarely, 
especially for guys who aren't lob threats, you rarely see the role man get hit. Rarely, rarely. Like that, I think that's the mark in today's game of the really, really good pick and roll players because they're manipulating you so much that they're hitting the role man that's not a lob. And the we were talking about this on live the other day with Andre Drummond and guarding DeAndre yes. Jordan with James Harden. And it's just like, yo, it's it's if you don't stay below DeAndre Jordan. It's James Harden's hitting him every single time. He has done that literally millions of times. And he's hitting him, and you're not jumping flat-footed higher than DeAndre Jordan is, and he's dunking it on you every single time. It's literally unguardable. That's where drop coverage originated from, I think, more than the guys shooting from 40 feet, was that the the archetypes of the five men became these rim runners that were lob threats. And now when DeAndre Jordan's literally getting paid – off of defending, I don't even know if he's this excellent defender or ever was. I mean, I could be wrong, but off of literally being a lob threat. The potential making, to Brandon Knight somebody again. <laughs> that's why. It's just, here. that's why, it, 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 now you have all these guys, the Jared Allens, the, you, you have all these guys that, because you are never throwing them the ball in the post, and but they can jump 12 feet in the air and dunk the basketball. So that is a huge plus. Um, so, nah, so I just think that bigs who short roll and have to play the second side, have their footwork has to be really, really, it's really important. So you don't know when you're getting the ball and you get the ball for bounce pass or you get off a hook and you got to come on two feet and whatever the case may be. So I think those things depended on the program. But yeah, an individual workout, I wouldn't put two kids who never met each other or barely worked with each other together to do that. I, I agree with that. And to get to, to your first point before I forget, um, what you say? Was it about uh, three on uh, three? Oh, is it a two man game in college? I'm gonna say this the best teams in college aspire to have it as a two man game whenever you can. If it's a two man game, I'm, and I'm, I'm really speaking about defensively, the less people you can involve guarding the pick and roll, the better. So if you can guard it two on two, it's a huge plus, but almost always defensively it's going to be at least three men, almost always, especially in college because of the rules and you can overhelp and because just like NBA trends don't really get to college until years, 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 years later. You know what I mean? So they've been icing. Ice was really the Celtics, the Bulls with Thibodeau. Like they were really icing and then it became prominent in the NBA. And it still hasn't really, really hit college. There are people who ice, you know what I mean? Um, but it's not everywhere. It's very rare when you see a team icing. You're not, that's not somebody, that's not like the standard of guarding pick and rolls on the side or even in the middle of the floor. So I would say trying to guard a pick and roll two and two, whether it's deciphering the personnel, uh, the, the, the screener or the guy using the ball screen, or it's the fact that how scheming, how you're scheming the pick and roll to, to guard it. And that's another reason why drop coverage is so prominent because all the shooting in the NBA and it helps people guard, but you're almost always guarding it with three people. Um, and the best teams who do accept that they're going to guard it with three people, try to guard it with two and a half people. Um, because that guy's got to be able to account for the role man or the guy setting the screen and also account for their man. Do you, um, do you have an answer? There's... No, I don't. But I wanted to ask a question that uh, you feel uh, passionate about. Um, do you think that snaking ball screens should be taught, period? Um, I'm a little less passionate about this than the other read, but I'm sure we'll get there at some point. Um, I just think there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that, that you see in workouts, and we've done it, like – because you see it all the time. And we talked about in the last podcast, like, of course I want to watch NBA basketball more than any other brand of basketball. So I get that's where trainers will get a lot of stuff that they build their workouts off of, but you're literally never going to see the coverage to snake a screen ever. You're just not going to. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say 90% of high school coaches across the United States of America do not know what a drop is. I'm just going to say that and I might be right. I might be wrong, but whether they know it or not, they're not doing it. <laughs> so you're yeah, never going to get about this. A, talk about a defensive coverage that has not 
uh, has not reached different levels other than the NBA. <laughs> yeah, because like I just I don't understand the point. I'm all, I'm obviously talking about anything pre college. Sure, if you're in college, and I think at that point it's a it's a scheming thing. You know what I mean? Because guys are so skilled that they could probably fit. Like oh, you're playing against T.J. Tibbs in Staten Island. They're icing. I should probably teach my guards how to screen or how to snake for a week. And maybe they'll be able to get a couple good reads out of that in the game. And when we practice against the scout team and things like that. But if, if you're in high school, you, no, it's not, it's not going to happen. So you're wasting, you're wasting your reps in terms of what's Can going I into this? a workout. This is kind of, this is kind of off topic, but if, if you're, if you're, let's just say like high school, let's just say they hardly, if ever see ice, right. And now you're going against a team that you know is going to play ice and you have two days to prepare. And I've actually had this conversation with a high school coach. Like, what do you guys do against ice? I said, well, let me preface it by saying that we have to guard ice in practice in our base defense. So it's a little different. Our guys have, like, it's a, it's a little bit more in our guys' package because they have to play against it. When you're just randomly seeing it, you're not going to change the DNA of your players in two days. It's not going to happen. So you're better, you're better off even if you're going to be in that position where you're going to get iced a lot, <laughs> you're better off trying to avoid that at all costs in this game or scheming somehow collectively as a team to defeat the ice. Like, don't think you're going to go into practice and like you said, start teaching guys how to snake ball screens if you never even brought it up before and think that guys are going to do it innately. Because yeah, they may snake the ball screen, but guess what? They're going to put the ball somewhere where they shouldn't have it, and they're better at you at defending that weakness. So you go and you snake it every single time, and the kid is just now doesn't know what to do, right, because the ice is so much better in the game than it is was in practice, and it's just dribbling the ball, and he gets back tapped every single time, or, or he gets ripped, or you try to tell people, like, oh, you got to – you got to reject it and hit the pocket pass, hit the guy in the pocket. And now there's two hands there because they're so trained to do that. It's just so much harder. But what, what would you do? Like, what would you guys do if you never played against ice ever? Your team ne is not prepared for it. And now you know you're going to get ice. What would you do? <laughs> I'll tell you what, what I did <laughs> whenever we would play Baruch and we never practiced against an ice ever. Uh, I would just throw the ball to the five man and the possession would be dead. So <laughs> that's yeah, what every... I, that's what I did. So shout out to Baruch for knowing that no one is going to figure out that they're, out that John they're Lee icing Lee. ball screens. Yeah. Shout they're always John really Lee. good defensively and I'm sure Yo, it has something to do with it. Well, there's a, from being on the staff and obviously having a lot of respect for John and their program, mm -hmm. there's many reasons why Baruch is so yeah. good defensively. It, like all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time, one of the best defensive teams in the country. And it's also because they're not afraid to, to try stuff <laughs> like that, you know? So um, John's a guy who definitely embraces the NBA. And you can see NBA fingerprints over stuff that they do. So, you know, shout out to him. That guy's a technician, obviously. Yeah, they scout scout. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they, they big scout. They big. Yeah. I would tell you a story real quick about, about <laughs> turn this, this turn this into the Brew podcast. I'm not going to use any names or the team. So we're playing a team. I think this is my first year at, at Baruch, maybe first or second. We're playing a team, and the scouting is obviously – it's very, very detailed, right? And our kids are very, very smart. And the kids who are smarter than the smart kids are just elite, right? Like a Bryla Page. Shout out to Bryla, big friend of the pod, right? Mm -hmm. So we're playing a team. It's like the second game of the season, and a freshman checks into the game for the team. The coach calls out a play, and this is one of the games where a coach called out a play like every single time, and our kids knew exactly what it was. Coach, kid is confused. So one of our kids is guarding the kid. Kid is super confused. One of our kids is running to the spot like mindlessly before the kid even thinks about getting there. And spot is like across the court. <laughs> so he knows kid got to get to the spot. Kid has no idea he's open. <laughs> and his teammate, <laughs> team doesn't know it's open. Team's telling the kid to get to the spot. <laughs> Our kid is already there. <laughs> Our kid is already there to get to the spot because he knows exactly what's going on. So 
Yeah, that's a that's a that's a big that's a big scout scout. You think that's that stuff hilarious. is so huge advantage when you're coaching with them, and obviously as a head coach, you take, you know, try to take as much from John Alisi as you can. But <laughs> when you play against it, even if, though you know like what's gonna happen with the scouting, it's still like it's uh, you got to find ways to defend against their scouting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's how good they are at it. Like it's so elite. So it's so rattling playing against that. Like you, when you hear when you hear a play called, like for me, right? If it was like elevator, elevator. or whatever, <laughs> if you hear a play call for me, and they're like elevator, elevator, Diaz, whatever, and it's like, oh come on, man! Like, well, what am I well to do with this? listen, listen, listen. All due respect, bro. If you're gonna run an elevator for somebody, I don't think you should call the play elevator. <laughs> well, no, we didn't call it elevator. We I called it like four elevator. or something. Yeah. I think we called it four, but. Uh, we're, we are about to go over the limit, but I wanted to end it with this one thing. If there are two players, so two, uh, two players in a pick and roll tandem that you could suggest, uh, to watch tape on in the NBA, who would you suggest? So uh, they have to be a pair. So I'm going to say, shout out to all the pairs. (laughs) I'm going to say Steve Nash and Marcin Gortat. That's my pick and roll wow. tandem that you should watch tape on. You know the NBA is starting to to to, to uh, ban the Gortat screen. I know right? it's whack. Oh, like the the screening somebody your guy. Yeah yeah, 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 like screening your guy. It's whack. So, sucks. Um, who you got, Harry? Or you need to think a little bit. I, like I want to just say James Harden and Kevin Durant, but I know that won't count for the purposes of this conversation. So I'm still thinking. So you can you can go. Um, so I'm trying to think of somebody who's with re- who's reasonable. You can't tell people to watch uh, James Harden. I know, and I know. DeAndre Jordan. Like, <laughs> yeah. you can't because there's not a lot of DeAndre Jordans walking around this earth. You know, because or James Harden. Of- <laughs> hey, well, that too. <laughs> well, that too. Um, so you know, uh, it's a great question, man. I also want to um, say Steph and Draymond, but like. I don't know if I can say that because that requires uh, you to. Steph's, so Steph Steph's Curry. gravity is so yeah. in the 99th percentile and Draymond's gravity is so in the one percentile. So like that causes for Draymond to have like, and I used to have this argument so much like, yo, why doesn't Draymond shoot that? It's like, no, because he is dominoes. Like he can, he can get another thing. He understands his role. He can shoot that every single time, but that is not, that is what everybody wants <laughs> and what yeah. Draymond doesn't want. It's not that he can't shoot, is that he understands that this is, we're an NBA basketball team. No matter what, we're still going to get a shot for somebody who shoots the ball a lot better than me. So, like, why am I shooting this just because I'm open? If everybody shot the ball because they were open, then the shot will go up in the first five to ten seconds every single possession. Yeah. It's just not the it's just not the point. But I do think that's good because Draymond makes a lot of great secondary reads. Right. Um wow, this it's Jabril no, Russell. I have I have my answer. I have my answer. I would say Jamal Murray and Jokic because Ooh, I, would, I, would, I don't think in terms of mechanical skill, which is a whole nother podcast, um, in terms of mechanical skill, they do anything that is just shit that you will never be able to do like you're not going to be Steph so you can't use them Uh, yeah I would say and as as great as Jokic is you can feasibly make a lot of these passes it just works for him because he's just he's different bro but like the everything that they do and all the reads that they make I think that you can take something from because Jokic odds are they're making the right play every time you know what I mean yeah, what I would say generally, because I can't, I'm really drawing a blank um, on NBA guys, but what I would say generally is watch the backups because they are probably a less superstar-ish version. Like, there's not a lot of backups that are coming off the bench and shooting from 40 um, or, or doing those things. So watch the back. I really enjoyed watching LaVert, Allen, pick and roll. Like, I oh, really yeah. enjoyed watching it, you know, because um, well- LaVert's a superstar. <laughs> I think, um, but I, I thoroughly really enjoyed watching that. So I would say watch the backups when they run pick and roll, like guys like uh, uh, Tyus Jones, 
Um, I know uh, – I don't think Oji Jang is, is on – I'm not sure well, who's on the roster. But guys like that – oh, actually, Ty Jones is on Memphis now. So, um, you know, guys that play with pace, guys that aren't, like, ridiculously athletic and don't shoot from ridiculously far, I think those are good guys to watch. But it's also – a lot of guys ask me that, like my kids. Coach, who should I watch in the pick and roll? Who should I watch shooting like? And they always want to go to an NBA player. And it's like, yo, we got synergy. Like, hold on. Let me think about it. And let's watch another college basketball player because the rules are different. You know what I mean? So, and we were talking about this the other day. Like, I'm really hesitant about teaching certain things to the kids because of the refs. And I know we'll get into that on a, a whole nother sure. thing. But, um, you know, so so the rules are different. There's a, You can't. There's a reason why low men are late sometimes on action in the NBA is because they can't stand in the paint. In college, you can literally park yourself right there. So it's a little bit different and it's, a, and it's different of a read. So, um, you know, I'd rather guys watch, you know, I'm a college guy, so I'd rather guys watch guys in college. All right. Well, if you made it to the end, uh, let us know who your uh, your favorite pick and roll tandem is. Just write us Instagram, run the city training, run the Tibby. Um, and that is that. Uh, we finna order this pizza and we out.